Hi, everyone. My name is Paige Hicks. I use she, her, hers pronouns. Um, I am a um, the current co co chair for the Women in Housing Network, and I'm joined by Melinda Carlson, who is the chair as well. And we have a great lineup for you all today. So I'm super excited to introduce our moderator and our panelists to you. All right. Hi, everybody. My name is Julie Leos. I'm the Director for Residential Education at the University of South Florida in Tampa, Florida. And um, I get the honor of uh, moderating this panel today with such a great group of women. And uh, right before we got on, we were noticing that the panelists, not the panelists, but the group of participants is also pretty amazing. And so um, somebody that was on the panel said, wow, so many of the people who are on this list could have done this panel. And I think that that is, um, what's so powerful about getting together like this and about sharing our stories and about how to help one another. So I want to make sure that you all get a chance to meet our panelists. And um, instead of me going ahead and introducing them, I want for them to go ahead and just say who they are and um, their pronouns and perhaps one title or accomplishment that they're proud of that they hold that helps them to mindfully support other women in our field. So Dr. Klotz, take it away. Hello everyone, my name is Anne Marie Klotz. I'm the Interim Vice President for Student Success at the New School in New York City. Um, and I thought about this question and there's a lot of things I could say, but I think at the end of the day, um, one of the things I'm proudest of is that I serve as a supervisor. Uh, people's name is on me and my name is on them. And I think many of us on the panel can share that we have benefited from really great relationships after we stopped supervising our staff. Uh, and I'm really grateful for that chance to be involved in people's professional journeys. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Chandra Myrick. I currently serve as the Executive Director for University Housing at the University of Tennessee in Knoxville. I use she, her, hers pronouns. One of the things that um, I feel most accomplished is about is that I'm currently a doc student and I am centering my research around women in housing. Hi everyone, my name is Dr. Jenna Hyatt and I serve as the Associate Dean of Student Living at Central Washington University and I use she, her, and hers. Um, I worked at several different institutions um, pretty intentionally across the country um, from private to large and regional to um, R1s and um, in, I, I feel like that really mindfully really helps support the understanding of how we show up with our work um, on a lot of different kind of climate and political stages. Uh, but probably one of the most accomplishments that I'm most proud of is that I actually did pursue that um, my dissertation with a focus on women senior housing officers in the Northwest region of the state, uh, United States, um, as there were only um, one in four were women. And so I really was able to dive in and listen to what was quite relevant for some of our, the pillars of our profession. And so um, that work and that body of work really had a lot of meaning to me. Hi, I'm Suzanne Price, and I'm the Director of Residential Learning at Clemson University. Um, I use she, her, hers pronouns, and uh, a title that I have that um, really is connected to my work in housing, but I think really helps me be mindful about working with women in particular is I'm also adjunct faculty for our Women's Leadership Program at Clemson University, and I've been very fortunate to help build the curriculum um, design that program and get to teach in that program and those women every year remind me how amazing the world can be and will be because these young women are really great and it's exciting. Hey everybody, my name is Trisha Rabel. I'm the Executive Director of Housing and Residence Life at Central Washington University. Um, and I am definitely the recipient of sponsorship and mentorship um, in Women Leaders with Jenna Hyatt as one of my mentors on our panel, who's also my supervisor. Um, one of my proudest parts of my job is getting to mentor and grow undergraduate students and help them find careers in higher education or, or otherwise that fulfill their passions and fulfill their service to others. That's so great. Thanks, everybody. I was um, just thinking as everybody was introducing themselves and saying something is that I just learned something new about almost everybody. So thank you for sharing that for 
for me and for the group. Um, so today we are going to have about a 45 minute conversation with our with our panel. Towards the end, we'll have an opportunity to connect uh, with you all and take any questions you might have. Um, we'll be together for about 45 minutes and then um, I will turn it over to Paige and Melinda who will share a little bit about um, what they're doing with the Women in Housing Network and ways for you all to, to be involved if you, if you wish. Um, I think also we'll have some time at the end for some questions and um, would love an opportunity for you all at the very end also to just affirm our panel and, and, and say perhaps something that you learned from them and thanks for being here, et cetera. Um, Cause it would mean a lot coming from you all as well as from me and from Aku Hawaii. So we're just gonna go ahead and get started because I know that you all want to hear from some more from these fabulous women. So one of my favorite TV shows is The Voice. And if you all watch The Voice, um, it was very different this year, but it was filled with great talent, just like this panel. It's, uh, it's hard to, uh, I guess it's like the Harvard freshman class, right? You can pick five other classes and they're just as awesome. But um, one, that show's my favorite. And I love just the idea of the way that they discover talent. And as you know, Kelly Clarkson, if you know who that is, um, the winner of, I believe, the first American Idol, um, has been a longtime coach on the show. And on the most recent, voice like in the finals there was a woman and her name was Tonisha and she was so good she is she exists still and she was she's a confident singer she's amazing and she sang one of Kelly Clarkson's songs and um, quite frankly she sang it better than Kelly did and you know I think that sometimes people not just women right might feel some trepidation some anxiety some fear over somebody being better than they are at something that they feel like that that's theirs and um, after she finished the song, which I can't even remember which song it was, Kelly said to Tonisha after cheering really loud for her, she said, yes, please let me know if you ever need a backup singer. I'm your girl. And I was thinking, I think it was like around the time that um, we were about to put this together. And I said, what a great example of somebody that's so awesome, that knows that somebody else that's awesome doesn't take away from that. Right, it just builds upon it, and um, I think that when you see examples like that in real life, which I do frequently from the the women on this panel, from my friends and sponsors and mentors, I think that those are the things that make you a little bit better because you know and you see that in other people, and so you want to do it for somebody else. And so I'm going to lead into this first question with that example because I think that. Um, that's why we're all here today, right? Is to, is to find ways that we can help one another and that we can ask for the help of somebody else if we're feeling that we need it. So the first question is, um, and I'll start with Dr. Klotz here, is what are some ways that you have supported women within our profession and how um, and from whom have you received help in your professional journey? Yeah, hello everyone. Again, I want to um, emphasize Julie's message here around the Kelly Clarkson thing. Um, we all need support right now. We all need backup singers and we all need to be other people's backup singers, maybe now in COVID more than ever. Um, almost all of us probably couldn't or shouldn't really be on this call. I, I saw Jenna just got called to step away for a second because we are in the thick of it. But when women are asked to show up, they will and they do. Um, and so I think that's a great, I brought you my hair today. I mean, we all did a lot of really above and beyond things today uh, to be with you all today. And I'm so happy we did. Um, so the question was about ways to support women and who has supported them. I've been really lucky in that I've always sought out women mentors and sponsors who were older than me, 10 to 15 years, who knew the road ahead, so that when I came to them freaking out about things, they were like, oh yeah, this is super normal. And it's everything from past supervisors, people who've been involved in the Coup Hawaii, uh, Deb Schmidt Rogers at DePaul University, Sissy Petty, uh, Terry Bump, Julie Payne Kirchmeyer, Tina Horvath. There's a whole host of housing women that I look up to and respect in so many ways. Um, and they all taught me something really important that I would wanna share, which is that the biggest gift you can give if you really truly support a woman is feedback. And the truth is that women and people of color and underrepresented people do not receive feedback because people are scared to give it. They aren't sure how, they're worried you're gonna to go to HR. And so they don't. And then what happens is we have a skill gap, a hole, and then nobody gives us feedback the hole gets bigger we go on another job the hole gets bigger and then bigger and bigger and we might continue to move up 
but eventually we will fall down that hole unless people care about us enough to be able to say, hey, you know I appreciate your work, here's where you went wrong, or here's how I can help you. I had one supervisor who would come in once a year with class because she knew that was the day, right? And so I think the best gift that we can give to women that we truly support is feedback. Thank you. I think one of the most important ways we can support women is to create space for women. As was mentioned earlier, um, many of us on this call, as well as those of you who are in the audience, um, I'm sure are all extremely busy. And I think one of the most helpful things is to help other women understand that you're willing to create space and time for them. Um, often in our work in housing, our experiences are not comparable even to our peers in other parts of student affairs and higher education and just creating space for women who truly are going through and sharing similar experiences as it relates to work but as it we also relate to personal life i think is very important i've certainly benefited from having a number of amazing women who have served as mentors um, in my life um, and who also serve as constant supports and cheerleaders to me now and a lot of that is because they've been willing to make themselves accessible to me and to give me time. Absolutely, this is Jenna. You know, I, um, I would say that I would, um, my support in the profession has come from folks who are what I would say way showers and true believers in me, who have really, you know, paved, um, helped me understand what is coming up and coming and showing that way or modeling the way and then also you know, who, who really believe in me and understand, get to know me and, and in turn, you know, do the same. Um, and I would say they're both quite a stimulant and a supplement. And we really have to have that um, to get us out of our own self and get us out of our own ruts. And I would absolutely agree um, with what Anne Marie is saying in so much that we need a support squad. Um, um, but we also need to know when to prune what gets in our way. So those habits or those fixed mindsets have got to be tested and you have to let it go. I think we hold on to things way too long and we really aren't moving forward. Uh, we spend way too much uh, muddling through things um, and we really just have to let that go, shut it and, and start and keep looking forward. Um, I would say that, um, and it was very telling when I was doing my dissertation that I recognized that I had never and have had a woman supervisor in my entire career. And I just am shocked at that uh, finding, right? And that reflection that I went through through that whole process. And I would say there's been a lot of men in the, in the profession at Kuhawai and so many women that I sought out and I didn't understand what and why that was happening and the way that it was until I could step back and really make meaning of it for myself. And I so I think that you have to find those ways to reflect and, and, and get that perspective, which is what way showers do, is they give you the perspective that you need, um, good, bad, or indifferent. You have to be open to it and um, get ready for it. And at the end of the day, at the, the, um, no matter how many hardships or any, the things that you go through, I think I had to keep listening to that one voice that just said, get up. It just said, get up constantly, just get up. No matter how hard things, just get up and keep doing it. Whether I understood how to do it, whether I faked my way through it, whether, I was ready for it. It was like, game on, sure, I'll do that. I'll help co-author a chapter in a book. I have no idea how to do that, but I'm gonna just get up and do it. And um, things like that. So you just, that's what I agree a lot with what has already been said. Um, I think I have identified women early in their career, particularly graduate students um, in our program uh, on campus and I think I've looked for promise. I've looked for potential and then really sought out saying, hey, can I get to know you? Can I offer you something? Um, I think one of the things that I like to say once I've built a relationship, um, my master's degree was in counseling and I hated almost every moment of those counseling classes, but now understand the value of those counseling classes. Um, so once I've built the rapport and the relationship to be able to look at somebody and say, the world is not about you and it may feel like it right now or you may feel like nothing is going your way you know i'm here to support you but also understand that the world is not about you who are you and what do you need and how can you contribute to this this world in which we live and how can you help make a difference now what you contribute is very important um 
But I think for particularly our younger women, um, they seem to get caught up in somehow believing that the world is about them. And then when things don't go their way, there's a crisis. Well, you know, things are not going to always go our way. Um, and so how can we be strong and how can we be resilient and how can we grow and support each other being, like Anne-Marie said, giving feedback, being honest, being transparent. Um, I, I think it's really important to be honest and transparent with people. Um, and, and I think if you build those relationships with people, you can do that more easily. I appreciate the mentors I've had in my life who've been able to do that. Um, and I hope that they will always know that they can, they can do that and can say, let me, let me be honest with you. I love to hear those words. Let me be honest with you because that means somebody cares enough to actually um, help me be successful. And then I want to help them be successful. Um, so many great responses and so many things. I've been scribbling down answers and thoughts and things that have popped in my head. Um, a, I guess a smaller way that hasn't been touched on yet that I feel like I can support others. I am often in meetings where I am the only woman in the room. I may be the youngest in the room. Um, there's people of unrepresented groups in the room and they are also the minority at the table. Um, and the amount of times I watch the credit be taken for something someone else says by a different person. Um, and so when I hear a colleague or a community member say something that is awesome and then I hear someone else claim it as their own credit, um, I try to go, yeah, that was awesome. Actually, Jenna, when she said that earlier, that was exactly what I think we should do. Um, and I, I learned that from some different mentors and have definitely kept that and then keep reminding myself of that because when someone helps me claim my credit, that helps me feel confidence and become a better leader. That's really awesome. Thank you ladies for sharing that. Um, the next question that I have for you all is to see if you might be able to share with us maybe a triumph or a challenge or what you think you benefit sometimes also when you, um, when you support women and when, what you've experienced in that, in that part of your life as you help other women in, in housing or in student affairs in general. I think one challenge as a black woman in housing and residence life. Um, sometimes when I've observed particularly other black women doing this work, um, it is definitely very easy at times um, for how we are received and respected to be misconstrued and misunderstood, um, be it from how we show up in spaces to the language that we use and even the experiences. And so I think one of the things that's very important for women in general, but particularly for women of color, is, is centering yourselves around being okay to have your voice heard. Um, again, I'm not sure there are, there are certainly moments and times when our voices are misunderstood and or not received, but nonetheless, to continue to make sure that our voices are heard when we are at the table. Yeah, I think what, I mean, what I would add, um, you know, I often, what, I would get to that we need to be willing to be in conflict but um, and wait our way through it, right? And then, like I said earlier, just get past it. Um, I think I realized that most of the things showing up for women in their, in their lives had become obligations rather than choices. And when part of that mentoring was being able to eliminate that and, and have them go through some processes to help understand that. Um, I think also, um, to, you know, uh, to, I oftentimes we also see a backlash, a, a painful change for someone um, who may be choosing their partner to be a true believer of you it makes a really big difference or whoever your squad is, again, that true believer. You know, I currently outrank in title and salary my partner and it was either going to be a gain or a loss and thankfully it was a gain. But if you don't have, you know, that, that type of support and encouragement, then you're, 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 you have embattlement um, in every setting that you're in. And so I think that that was certainly a challenge that I've observed with women is really owning and getting um, honest and deep with that, those type of relationships all around you. Um, you know, I think at the end, that declaration is, you know, I can and I want and I will, and just letting you go, get off that ledge. You know what I mean? Get in the game, speak up, stretch. and. And that stretching is just starting to take action on the things you need to do. And I think sometimes we just have to push to do that. 
I will share a little bit of a story um, about something I observed um, a few years ago when one of our administrators was leaving to take a different job, a great job somewhere else. Um, the person under that administrator, who was a very competent and amazing woman, who happens to be my supervisor, um, it, around campus, people would say, oh, is she, how's she going to do now that he's leaving or, you know, and, and nobody meant it in a negative way. I really don't think because everybody knows she's very competent, but that was probably one of the first times that I thought, what, what do you mean? Is she going to be okay? Of course, she's going to be okay. She's going to be great. She's always been great. She might even be better. Who knows? Like, I don't, I, and, and again, I don't think anybody meant it in a negative way about him or her, or anyone, any of the people, but it was just this kind of sad notion that that she was losing something in that. And and it may not have had anything to do with sex. I don't know. But I, I observed it and and it really struck me. And and she knows I've shared this with her. But um I found myself often saying to people, Oh, she's gonna be just fine. She's great. We have a plan. Like we're moving forward. We're gonna grow. Like and again, then I thought, oh, God, I don't want to make him look bad because that's not what I'm trying to do. But, you know, it, it's it's why do I think as women, we absorb this more than others and, and really take it on and try to help people understand. One day in the world of Zoom, I will remember to unmute myself, but it's not. Um, I thinking of challenges and thinking of um, my master's degree was an all women's cohort at an all women's college. Um, so we spent a lot of time talking about glass ceilings and um, labyrinths of leadership and what that looks like versus there's not a, a ceiling, but it's more of a, a maze that is almost impossible sometimes for women to, to get through um, to achieve a higher position or their, their passion. Um, I have had many friends in the last three years leave housing. Um, women, especially with the women that are parents, find this was not a place that they ultimately could feel supported. And whether that is the grind we put all of ourselves under to achieve and do everything and be perfect in every area of our life, parenting, partnerships, work, home, whatever it is. Um, but I don't see my male colleagues go through that in the same way. Um, and that has been something that I've been really pondering is what does it mean to work in higher ed? What does it mean to work in housing in a 24 seven culture um, and still have boundaries and know that there it's okay to have those boundaries. Um, and that's something that I'm still struggling with and still considering as I continue my position. Yeah, I found it really hard to narrow it to one, but the one that I will say in my experience, when we look to hire people, women are often hired based on their experiences, and men are often hired based on their potential. And what that creates is really uneven hiring practices. Um, we are never ready, really, for anything in life. The job, the partner, the baby, the house, whatever your thing is. Um, but I just find different measures of evaluation. And so when I think about the ways that I was able to progress in my career like relatively quickly, it was because someone was brave enough to say, you're probably not the most qualified, but I see in you the potential. And that takes a lot of bravery, that sponsorship almost at its finest. Um, but I think that we, we do this often um, as women, where we evaluate women very differently in the hiring process than we do men. So again, women based on what they've done and men on their potential. And I think until we flip the script on that, we're really missing a large part of the talent pool. Thank you. Some really excellent points. I just put in the chat, if everybody received it, is that there's a small button on the bottom. Oh, good. I see a number there. There's one person that put something in the Q&A. But we'll have people that are monitoring the Q&A uh, button, and uh, when we get towards the end, we'll have a, a chance to get to some of those. Our next question um, is as follows. So, we're gonna start with Dr. Hyatt here. So what resources would you recommend for women who are seeking guidance on how to navigate this field as a woman? Um, and further, what existing mentorships or networks are out there 
that they could explore, that they can take advantage of. What advice do you have about that? Yeah, we have a large, uh, we're really fortunate here, um, particularly obviously with the Women in Housing Network that pays attention to um, you know, support like this um, in large and local ways, right? Attending the NASPA Women's Institute was, um, was quite incredible. You know, there's nothing like sitting with um, Ellen Hefferman from Spelman and getting basically the cliff notes on how a search firm's process firsthand and, um, you know, getting to, you know, hear, you know, the, the personal stories and respect that um, folks that you really care about and their personal That's triumphs. Cool. Um, so, but I, you know, I've really taken advantage of um, a lot of institutes within our association, NHTI, mid-level senior housing officer, professional standards institute. Um, and then I've really tried to work on some stretch goals. Um, and I think, uh, you know, the research poster series was one that we were, I think there was, there was a gap and we needed to fill that and, you know, was able to coalesce a group to, you know, believe in it a little bit and move along. Um, one of the things I do in a more local way and is uh, I have this thing called FWOC on campus, my favorite women on campus, and they didn't know each other, but I knew them. And I was like, I, I just want to be at coffee frequently. And so I just you know, reached out the hand and, and said, I'm going to invite you and if you, hopefully you can come. And once they all got to know each other, I mean, it was just like, it was it, you know, we really found our, our, our squad um, locally. And so I think it's just a matter of stepping forward and not waiting. It's not going to always land in your lap. But so that mentorship, um, is, you know, I think you, you can own that more than you think you can. Um, and so I would, I would say, you know, assemble. Um, definitely there's a lot of more structural in institutes that there's nothing like, you know, that opportunity to imprint and get away and spend that time committed to yourself and that and those relationships that no one can take away it's an amazing experience um, and then you know, things like this us taking the time just to stop and talk about our own stories and what we can share is really helpful um i think on pretty a uh, global level but also a, a more local level um i think navigating this field the first thing we have to do is ask ourselves what is this field today? Where are we headed? Who are we? I think that higher education in general um, is changing, has been changing, and especially now is changing. Um, and that, you know, how, how we respond to students, who our students are, who our colleagues are, um, I think there's so much intersection of identity and, and question around what is justice, especially today, and, and how is higher education a part of this or not? And I think that we have to think globally about the field and then, okay, now what is my responsibility? What is my role? How can I be successful? How can I help students learn and grow, colleagues and everybody learn and grow in what is a very complex and difficult, difficult time and a changing field. I, I do, I just think our field is changing. And I've had this conversation with um, senior administrators to say, but, but what we learned in graduate school is not true anymore. You, you know that, right? Like there's been a lot of new things that have come along in 25 years and, and things that they learned five years ago are now not true anymore. And I just really, you know, think that we have to think about our role within the complex and, and evolving um, field of higher education and housing. Um, I also think that it is essential, um, whether it's a former mentorship, sponsorship or whatever, but to build a relationship with people with whom you can really trust and have open and honest conversations. Um, I, I have been very fortunate to have that across campus um, over the years and different people, but that it takes, it takes energy, it takes time. It does not happen necessarily organically. It can't just happen coffee every six months. You have to really invest in people. And I think that's, that's what we're gonna have to do to be successful in this evolving um, field. I'm trying to think the things that were most impactful in terms of networks or resources or time 
Um, and I find that I go through a cycle where if I'm lacking confidence or struggling in a position or not feeling like I can use my agency, um, education continues to be the thing that helps me gain that. So whether a master's degree, I just finished my doctoral degree, which was a grind and not something I'm hoping to ever repeat, but um, seeking out resources and education, I um, was able to go to the Senior Housing In Officer Institute this year, and it was um, really career changing in terms of how I considered my leadership. Um, as much as possible, those things, and whether it's resources that aren't available to you, then read a great book. There's some amazing leadership books that can give opportunities for reflection. I don't love school, which is probably something that I shouldn't say given that I work at one and I have a doctorate. But what I will say from that is what really helped me was reading research from other women about other women. So I know within, even within this panel, there's work being done on women in housing, uh, Latina women in housing. Um, my work is on female college presidents and how they got there. Reading other people's scholarship and reading their stories uh, really helped me and really helped resonate. One of the presidents told me something that I'll never forget. She said, at the end of the day as a woman in leadership, it's the loneliest job ever. Like you're there to make a decision that you have to make that every day at least 50% of people will hate. And so sometimes there's um, peace and solidarity. So I would definitely say the scholarship piece. The other piece I would say, the biggest resource for me, and it hasn't always been the easiest, I mean, see also my piece about feedback, is about diversifying your sponsorship. And so it would be real easy for me to find a bunch of perky white girls and say mentor me, but they would not really help me. Um, and so what I have often looked at is wisdom and care and critique from men of color, from queer women, from other women who see something different than I do. And sometimes that's really painful, um, but necessary. And so I will share that some of my, um, my biggest resources have been when people, and I think um, Suzanne said it clear enough, like when people are invested to care about you enough, I think that is often where your biggest learning occurs. I think one, um, one resource I would um, encourage women to consider, particularly if you are planning to advance in the advance in housing, is to really expand your network beyond the area that you currently work in and or have expertise in. And what I mean by that, and I saw one of the questions come up in the chat about the caring side and, and getting assigned caring roles and responsibilities. Um, Often, um, many people in housing, not just women, get their start in residence life. Um, and I think as people continue to move up, there, there's a tendency to move up within residence life. But when you are seeking um, advancement to a senior housing officer role, it's really important that you have perspectives outside of residence life. And so one of the best ways to learn is to seek out those people who work in housing and do something different than what you're currently doing to help give you a more comprehensive understanding of the complexities that come with housing programs and to build your own skill set beyond just the things that you do in your day to day work. Julie, you're muted. It wasn't true, I guess. <laughs> I, uh, what I was going to say is that, um, just thankful for, for what you all have shared and that it is aligning somewhat with what folks are asking in our Q&A, you know, about um, how we might support um, our queer women of color and our minoritized women and um, how sometimes we need to just be able to learn more back to what Suzanne was saying about the about how to help the different populations of individuals that are on our campus that are our colleagues that are our friends um, I think it's it, it, sometimes just because some someone is your friend you don't know everything right and so then you help each other to to learn and to and to grow and it's not always necessarily their responsibility to teach us so as Dr. Klotz was saying what kind of research can you find that can can shed some light on some of the, the topics and things that either you're uncomfortable with or haven't um, been able to talk about much and therefore sometimes uncomfortability is not that you don't want to be in the space, it's just you don't know enough, right? And so sometimes 
learning is our responsibility and, and helpful to the women that are around us. So thank you so much for, for sharing that. I think that's really important. Um, one of our questions um, that is coming up is, what advice do you have? And I think you gave a little bit of advice in the last question too, but what advice do you have for new professionals that are seeking uh, a, a woman mentor? How would somebody do that if they don't have one? Seems kind of, it seems overwhelming sometimes when you're a young professional and you, you need some help. Right, and, and I will fully admit that I was one of these um, younger professionals that uh, set up a lunch one time with Verna Howell when I was finishing my graduate degree and we had to cancel and I never rescheduled because I was terrified and didn't know what we would talk about. And, you know, 15 years later, ended up working for her and, and trying to figure out, um, you know, why didn't I go to that lunch? Um, but I, I think that, again, it is about identifying people that know things, that experience things who are different from you, as Anne-Marie said. Like, I, I, some of my mentors are people that really challenge me, um, some women. I don't always agree with the choices they make or how they do something, but I know that we can go to lunch and we can talk about it or we can have a private conversation and say, well, this is why I did that. Oh, okay. And then I learn. I learned about her experience. I learned about her identity in that experience. And I think that's critical, particularly when so many things are polarized in higher education and on our campuses in the world. Um, for me to try to build those relationships so that I can really get to know somebody genuinely, um, again, does not mean I always agree or we're going to be the best of friends. That's, it's different, but it's about respect. It's about learning. It's about growth. It's about support. Um, those are, you know, all things that I do with my children too. And I certainly don't like them all the time. Um, but I, you know, I really want to see them be successful. So I, I think that's what you, you have to look for somebody who's willing to invest in you and for whom you're willing to invest the time and energy too, because it's a two way, two way relationship. Um, but I think acknowledging that and being vulnerable, somebody that you know, you can be vulnerable with, because if you can't be vulnerable, um, you're not really going to get all that you need. Um, so I think that's critical. I think it's a little bit like blind dating. Like you put yourself out there, you ask someone over an email, like, Hey, can I, I have a question and you think of what that question might be like, mm, what, what have they talked about recently that I, I do want to know more about you get coffee. And if it goes well, you're like, I'd love to visit it again. Would that be okay? And you feel a little bit less authentic and asking, at least I do. Um, but then from there, it just kind of rolls. Um, I've been in positions where I, I didn't have a mentor at the university I was at. I was in a spot where I didn't have a lateral position and the next position up was in a very different spot of the profession. Um, and it really caused a hole, I think, for me in terms of my development for a long time. Um, and then I found that I needed to seek the, the feeling you get from a mentorship or the experience and the advice you get from a mentorship from, from people that weren't necessarily more experienced than me or had more of a higher rank than me. So I um, sought out some people at the university that um, we're in coordinator roles that had great experience and great thoughts that really helped challenge me and, and provided that support and that advice. Um, and it was more of a mutual mentorship versus a, a hierarchical mentorship. Yeah, I uh, two quick points about mentorship. I think it doesn't have to be that serious. And I participate a lot in what I would call drive-by mentoring. Um, and I'm going to use an example. Hopefully she won't kill me. But um, I really like Jenna. I don't know her super well, but many, many years ago, she reached out to me about a question and I had to give her some advice that she didn't have to listen to me. She was probably like, I've never even had lunch with you, lady. Um, but I felt like there was a potential roadblock that she was looking at and I couldn't in good conscience tell her to, to swerve to avoid that rock. Whether she did it or not, totally her own call. She's a smart woman. But I think we have to be able to participate in more sort of drive-by mentoring, right? Moments where we might be like, oh, I don't know her too well. Maybe she took it the wrong way. She can make her own decision, but I think it's on all of us to be able to do that. The second part goes to um, what Trisha was saying. Mentorship can happen across levels up and down. And so when I was an assistant director of housing back in the day, there was a hall director I thought was really smart and I knew she was gonna go places. Uh, years later, that person is Rachel Aho, who's the director of housing at the University of Utah. And I still will call her for advice, even though I've been her supervisor, I've known her in different ways uh, for years now, but 
who's to say that as we move older, we necessarily have all the answers. She has skills and strengths that I don't have. And so sometimes I need her brain to kind of help me when I'm thinking through things. And so I think it does require us to put ego aside and say, who can we learn from and with, even if we perceive that we may be, you know, more advanced or however you want to say it than that. I think when you think about mentors, one of the things I would say is don't look at it as a one and done type deal. Um, the saying it takes a village is very true. Um, I have different mentors in my life who serve very different roles for me and be okay with that. Um, I think sometimes we're looking for this utopia that is going to be this one match and we're going to be together forever. And the reality is, is that I think multiple people can offer multiple things. And I really encourage people to think about that when you're thinking about mentors. And I definitely have people that I go to for very certain and specific things in my life and who can give me feedback in very different ways that may be needed in, in one particular way or another. And so I definitely think don't consider the one and done, um, consider a way to build you a network of mentors. Um, and it really is something that I found to be quite beneficial when I think about the people who serve as mentors in my life. Yeah, I think, I think what I wanna add is um, I've found myself in positions where during salary negotiations, I recall, for instance, hiring in a hiring situation where I had to spoon feed the process to this woman I was hiring because they were so inexperienced and I just wasn't going to let it happen even though I was the appointing authority making the decisions I was you know obviously needed to coach at that time um, and help them help themselves because there's such a, a gap and um, a salary gap and I couldn't go forth knowing that this was um, how we were going to continue getting her here that I wanted to help with that pay gap right away and but they were not knowing how to manage the whole thing and so you know fiercely advocating and mentoring when they don't even know you're doing it is a really big deal and right now we find ourselves in these you know senior level positions and there's so much that is done that is unseen and I that's when we really have to pay attention and show up um, there's such a long-term equity multiplier effect. And if we are not helping change that, um, and uh, then it's, we're gonna be in this continuous cycle and, and a major problem that continues. Um, the hard thing is that not everybody gets to see it or know it, right? You have to ha also rest in, in some of that own work that you don't always get to you know, lift up. Um, I think what I wanna also say is when I'm mentoring, I have these guiding markers and you know, many on this call, I think are going to laugh because they could probably tick it off, but I cannot help but say them. And those are, first of all, every day is your interview and you have to ask yourself, uh, would I be hired? Would I hire myself today if I, if this was my on-campus interview? So you got to show up and you, everything that you're being evaluated constantly. Um, you know, there's a PLE for everything to suspend judgment and just don't, don't jump to conclusions. There's a perfectly lo logical explanation for things. Um, I think you, when you mess up, you fess up, you keep a level head and you can't exaggerate things. You have to be able to be really, you know, measured with how you're communicating um, at the levels that we're at. Um, we need to pay attention. You know, the politics is really the texture and the math of what we're walking on constantly. And I often will tell my staff, um, you'll never, if you never try, you'll never know. And you'll never know if you don't try. And I always say to my staff, if you don't ask for it, you're not going to get it. And so you better be asking for it constantly. Um, and so I just want to just mention that. I just think they're, um, th that's the mentoring. And those are the things that I think have helped me and show up in my work every day in the spaces. And I constantly say them in hopes that they'll imprint because I know that those things have imprinted on me from the women that have um, guided me and been way showers. Thank you, everybody. I think, um, that that is really powerful. So we, I just had a graduate student leave to go take a job back in Texas. And then another person left to go take a job in Wisconsin. And I wrote them a card. We can still do that, right? In the age of COVID-19, I wrote them a card. Um, have, hope they let it sit in their car for 48 hours. But what I wrote in there was, here's some to-do, here's a to-do list for post-grad school, right? And one of the things I wrote was, um, your director needs you and it's okay for you to talk to them. 
And the, one of the reason why I write that is because I think that sometimes um, we feel like maybe there's nobody around us to help. And, um, but also there are so many people around and the reality is that um, higher ed leadership is busy. And I don't really like that word, but we really are. And there is nothing that I want more than for somebody to just say, hey, do you want to go to coffee? Because I had probably been thinking about it for two months and I haven't had five minutes to put it on your calendar. Um, and so I think that I, what I hope is that uh, that person can check that off their to-do list when they get to their institution, just to know that they want to hear from, you know, people want to hear from you. They want to know that you're there. And um, my previous supervisor, Linda Casper, who I think is on this list, would always say my door is always open, right? And so you have a choice to come in. And, um, and so I think that that's a really important thing when we're talking about how to seek out a mentor is that it's okay to ask. And they might be, they might say no because they don't have the capacity, but they might say, I know somebody who is like looking for somebody to mentor that I think that you would really get along with and things like that. And so it's um, sometimes trial and error, but the more that we seek out feedback, honest feedback, and we're ready to hear it, the better we can all be. So thank you all for sharing what you shared today about that. Um, our last final like prescribed question for the panels before we get to questions and I turn it over to, to Paige and Melinda is, what is one thing that you think women should consider when lifting up other women as they are uh, climbing in the field? And I guess climb is an interesting word, but as you are progressing and, and succeeding in your, in your, in your career. Um, I'm happy to start. I think that that is an interesting one. I, I believe everyone has their own path and that you get to set your own path. Um, and so when I, the climbing word triggered me a little bit, I don't know if that's the right word for trigger either, but the, the idea that we're climbing or we're achieving or we have to reach a certain rank or be a dean or a VP or whatever, um, I struggle with that because I think people can have really happy, meaningful serving careers, um, doing all sorts of different things. Um, and so when I think about teammates or colleagues and one of the areas I try to work on is sponsorship. So when there's an opportunity, and especially as I'm trying to do better with my own boundaries, trying to support others having those opportunities. Um, I was out for three months in the fall with a family emergency that was very trying. And in that, got to see team members who I would have taken the opportunities and not passed them on, get to experience them. Um, and that was a great reflection for me of how could I all the time, whether I'm here or not here, support my teammates and my team members in, in getting those chances to, to stretch themselves and to um, see what opportunities they could really benefit from. I don't aspire to be liked. I mean, I hope I'm liked, I think I'm fun. But I aspire to be respected. But I think still in our field, likability trumps talent every time. And so I think, all the time about how I'm able to use my privilege in my position and my role to help really get down to the people who are really great at doing the work um, and to try to put aside those notions about likability because we know that's a double-edged sword for women, people of color, for things like that. When I was 28, I was asked, 27, I was asked to be on a panel and I said yes because it was in Hawaii, so who wouldn't, right? But there were six women and one of these things was not like the other, and I was the other. I was an assistant director. Everybody else was like Dean, Chancellor, Gwen Dungey, the head of NASPA. I was like, I don't know why I'm here. But everybody had to get up and say how they got to be in their role. And this woman, who I won't name, stood up and she said, I became a vice president early because I didn't want to go to other people's bullshit meetings. And then she sat down and she was done. And I was like, whoa. Um, but I think what I took from that, uh, most importantly, was that you don't have to move up. There are 35-year-old hall directors and 35-year-old presidents, and neither of them are wrong. They are all choices. Um, but however, there is some power and some privilege in the ability to move up and set the agenda for your people. It means that the people I hire sometimes look non-traditional. I'll hire younger people maybe before they're ready. I'll hire people who they say, I don't know if they could really be in New York City. I don't know if they could do this. I don't know if they could do that. Um, if I can see potential in them. So all that to say, I think my biggest piece of advice is you get to be the architect of your own life. It doesn't mean that it's consequence free. It doesn't mean that you're not going to get dinged, but you should have the freedom to create the life that you want to professionally. And that's what I try to instill in women every day 
there's not a right or a wrong. There's what you want to do. Um, and so I hope that women will really um, take that to heart. When I think about what other women should consider when lifting women up, it's really that it's probably one of the most worthwhile investments you'll ever make. Um, I will say that the people who keep me going today are women who have mentored me and women who would say that I serve as a mentor for them. And in every turn I have, I am constantly receiving the benefits of taking the time to pour into people and being open to let people pour into me. And so it is probably one of the most worthwhile, if not the most worthwhile investment I've ever made in terms of how I use my time in giving and receiving from others. And I think what I'll just add is that, you know, you have to remember that it's their journey, not yours. And you, you know, you get to be on the sideline of cheering them on. as like, I would say like true, a true believer in them and a way shower. Um, but it, at the end of the day, it's their journey. And it's, um, I want to keep that in mind. Um, I think the one thing I would contribute is, um, again, it goes back to being authentic and honest. And, and that's just something I really believe in. But um, understanding your culture and your environment. And um, it doesn't mean that they're ideal. It doesn't mean that we shouldn't work to change things that need changing, um, that need improving, no matter what our cultural or environment is. But I've worked at the same institution for 23 years now. And um, I've seen some change. It's been slow in most cases. Um, and that's very, very frustrating to um, other particularly younger professionals um, and particularly, um, I would say, professionals of different identities that don't, we don't see represented um, in, on my campus as much and in the culture. And so I find myself a lot trying to help people talk through what does this mean for you? Honestly, what does this mean? Is this the kind of work you want to do here? Do you want to do this work somewhere else? You know, what, what do you need in the, the path, as someone said before, finding the path that's best for you. Um, but again, recognizing the context and the culture and how that really, really impacts your success or lack of success, whether or not you can stay somewhere. Um, so I, I think that's, that's really important. And I too, you know, the, the um, climb, I, there, I've read the book, Lean In, Sheryl Sandberg's Lean In, and there are several things in that book I do not care for, although I'm sure she's a brilliant woman and, and things. But um, one thing I do appreciate about the book is she talks about the jungle gym. And you think about how we all can, we can fall through a crack, we can climb across, we can go under, we can go over, and that there are so many different paths and that we just don't need to think of, of our professional lives as a straight up ladder. And, and that's a very patriarchal way of thinking about it. Absolutely. And Suzanne, you touched on a good point, and I'm looking at the time, and we've had such a great time together that we don't have a ton of time, but um, our, the first question, the, the winner of the question we get to ask is the first question that came through. Um, and the question was about queer women of color and just women in general and how we might, the question reads like this, I'd love to get the panel's take on how we as women show up for marginalized and minoritized women as women can at sometimes perpetuate some injustices um, of us in marginalized identities and experiences. So is there, are there a couple of folks that may want to just touch on that before we pass it on to Paige and, and Melinda? I think one way, um, one way to support marginalized women is to not assume you understand their experience um, and to really be open to learning and hearing from them, not just about their experiences, but also what their needs are. Um, I think sometimes there's a tendency to assume that all groups need same things and have same experiences. And the reality is that's just not true. Um, it's really about individualizing that care and that support um, for that particular woman. I would just add that it's, it's, it's about learning and whether that's through building a relationship with somebody or understanding who they are and what their needs are just because they may look a certain way or share a certain identity with someone that doesn't, you, you don't know that person. Um, but learning in general, I, I, 
I'm a big advocate of continuing to, to learn and grow. And um, I, again, I, I go back to my teaching and I really appreciate that opportunity because we learn all these theories and we learn all these things, but then I look for examples to bring to the classroom to say, and here are women doing this. So let's talk about these women. What are they doing? How are they different? How are they similar? Um, so I think it is really about continuing to, to challenge yourself to learn and grow in the research and literature and with individuals and pay attention to the world around you. I think I will always often ask, what am I not seeing or what am I not hearing? Or maybe what have I seen and heard that I can't synthesize yet? And I think that's part of like the being willing to have a team who you think um, is willing to give you feedback, is willing to trust. And I know that that's hard, especially if you're in a position that's on the org chart lower than myself. Um, but I never hesitate to pop into offices to say, you know, tell me what I don't know. Uh, I think sometimes I'll even say, tell me what I got wrong. And sometimes I say that kind of with one eye open, right? Because you never sort of know what you're going to hear. But I think it's about just making yourself accessible and that people know that they can share with you the things that um, you might not be seeing. And I really appreciated those moments with staff. I think um, something too that I can say about the women on this panel and some many other women that I know that can address this question also is that they're just many women especially these on the panel are just really aware of who they are and how they walk through the world and um, sometimes just acknowledging the privilege you have the way in which you can help other people the, and acknowledging what you don't know helps us walk through the world in a way that um, other people want to that other people open up to right that they feel like this is the person who's a who's the real deal who can help me navigate through this process and every once in a while we just need to um, hang on to to those people who are really wishing for our success and they might not understand everything and they may get things wrong and they may say things wrong um, but i most people are trying really hard and um, I know that, especially in times like these, when everybody needs, there's so much emotional capacity that we're trying to have for other people, that um, the learning and growing from, from the people who are around us is really important, so thank you. So we have a couple of minutes, and I'm gonna pass it on to, to Paige and Melinda, and um, thank you for being here with us and, and keeping us company. Okay, good. Thank you so much, Julie. So I'm Melinda Carlson. I'm an Assistant Vice President and Dean of Residence Life and Student Housing at SMU and want to thank all of the panelists and thank you for everyone that was with us today. This was, I've written so many notes down and, and can't wait to go find my favorite women on campus. And so I want to thank my favorite women on Zoom um, for, for doing this for all of us today. Be sure and connect with us. Reach out to um, Paige and I. I think the next slide actually might have our um, yeah, our contact information is on there, our email addresses. You can also look up the Women in Housing Network on Facebook, through the ACOI website, under communities. And we want to continue to expand our network to best serve women in housing. Also be on the lookout for future webinars. On June 23rd, there is a session through Virtual ACE um, that will have another powerhouse group of women on it to, to talk with us and connect in ways that maybe we weren't able to today. Um, we also are reviving the Talk About series. If you don't know what that is, look it up on YouTube. It is women in our profession talking about topics that matter to us in video form. We can thank Julie for starting that um, a handful of years ago. And then we are also developing both a recognition series and a mentor series. Um, so be on the lookout for that as well. Um, and then we wanna send a special shout out to Deanna Hughes at Florida State and then the, and the um, membership development committee that made this happen today as part of the Women in Housing Network. So thank you all very much. Uh, and finally, um, you know, I think along with that last question that was asked, we're hopeful that the Women in Housing Network can be a place where all identities are seen and heard at all times, and especially right now in our time, uh, given what's going on in this country. So, so this is a, a place for that, and, and thank you all for being here and for your support, and we hope we can uh, continue to support you. So on behalf of Paige and I, um, Paige, who is an absolute rock star, um, thank you for joining us today and for taking the time, and we look forward to more of this in the near future.